Hi, I'm Keegan. This is a bunch of gamers, and welcome back to GM Talks. I am joined by several people here today who are working on the fan project Werewolf the Essentials. Uh, how about y'all introduce yourselves? Hello, everybody. My name is Mundus. My pronouns are it and she, and I am the project director and the lead writer. And I am Dove Sunseed Sword. Hamid Korax, Knight of Helios, Deliverer for the Hermetic Order of Swift Light. And I am in love with this project. I am happy to say that I got very chummy with Mundus early on with her original release, Hearthbound. And I have been delighted and privileged to be part of this project as a writer, as a bird, as a financier, and as a squawker. And I'm Lee, Lee Cat on all of my socials. Uh, I am an artist, but for the project, I am a writer and incredibly happy to be able to do justice to my favorite tribes of finally, because they deserve some love nobody else is seemingly willing to give. So I'm going to be doing that. I'm also the one person that got the short stick on her favorite animal being one of the worst tribes that exists in this lore. <laughs> that's fine. So yeah, I was able to look over the the first preview Mundus sent me, and so we'll just jump right into it. I see that this pulled a lot of inspiration from the Mind's Eye theater setting. And what did you pull, and what did you kind of leave behind? Because I noticed the dates are a little different, too. Like, the end of the apocalypse and Anthelia showing up is 1985 instead of, I think, they said 1999 or 2005 in the, uh, the Mind's Eye theater book. Correct, yeah. And um, Anthelios shows itself once, uh, I, I think it's Apollo 11 lands on the moon. I set that back in the 60s. So I guess in terms of pulling inspiration, as you said, like a good chunk of this comes uh, directly from Mind's Eye Theater Werewolf. We are now after the Age of Apocalypse and we are now entering the Age of Heroes. Although, in terms of additions, I am considering this uh, very much so an addition holistic approach to the game. I'm pulling a little bit from everything, from first edition through revised. Not pulling from 20th anniversary edition as much as people would assume. I'd say that in terms of timelines, I've shifted everything back a little bit for a few reasons. One is that presenting a supernatural story in a modern setting is tricky, in short. When you're dealing with an age of smartphones where everybody has a camera with them, and you're dealing with an age of information being immediately available to you, I find that taking some of those things away and forcing people to think more critically about how they find and seek their information and share it with one another um, can provoke some very unique and personal interactions with each other. Another reason why I said it a little bit further in the past is that I'm wanting to make the presentation of Werewolf to be a little bit more timeless. When you're talking modern technology, technology is changing almost year to year right now. When you're looking at things from both in terms of websites to readily available technology that a person has to like modern pop culture things that are happening, within just a few years, a lot of those things aren't really going to be holding the same relevance that they once did. And one of the things that I'm hoping to create with Werewolf the Essentials is to present a game that's going to hold the same relevance now that it is in 20 years. I'm not going to be planning this to be something that is going to be successfully updated or modernized unless the storyteller decides to do that at their own tables. I also think there's uh, something else about like making it timeless and about the modern world and modern technology just advancing all the time, especially on the particularly on the GM side, running games, running this ur urban fantasy constantly on the modern world, especially with how chaotic current age is, can be very tiresome. And sometimes you just need escape especially with world of darkness it's easy for every other setting doesn't matter if it's official or homebrew to be set in a modern big sprawling city with skyscrapers and edge to cutting edge technology and it gets exhausting and i think this is a chance to take a step back both in time and both in scale 
a little bit and see things from another perspective, breathe that fresh air and try to approach things differently. My general take is the timeless nature of moving things back into an area that brings about the same level of mystique and peak interest in perhaps what we might consider to be late stage Americana, like the X-Files or Twin Peaks or other of those really interesting, weird type of stories. And it allows you to generate material within the space of that. And the part that I really find to be juicy, what we're working on, you might have already seen some of that in the preview, is I'd like to believe that we're doing what a lot of the more uh, later published werewolf documentation, including werewolf 20th edition, failed to do. And what I mean by that is they did not really give perspective and new players a concept of where their character is coming from. They really, in my opinion, dropped the ball on that. And there has been drips and drops of that type of material in prior releases. And I like to think that we are inspired by that and we're taking it a strong step further so that a player can really feel the world they're getting into they don't feel like an outsider and kind of leaning on well i'll figure it out as i go along you don't have to figure it out as you're going along just read uh just read one hour of this you'll get it okay it kind of reminds me of the common the common refrain from a lot of people saying that like call of cthulhu is best in the 1920s solely because of a lot of the things you talked about now like gathering information the the advent of cell phones, uh, et cetera, et cetera, which is why a lot of people are hesitant to run that particular setting in the uh, in the modern age. And with Werewolf, especially because it is such a product of its time that setting it firmly in kind of like the 1980s, 1990s makes the most sense from like a just look and feel. Is that kind of kind of getting the hit the nail on the head on that one or am I? off base no that uh gets it pretty close another thing that i'm kind of aiming for this is to kind of pull back from the concept of the guru having a fully global understanding of what is happening everywhere at once there's a weird and kind of almost doting nature to a lot of the older literature and a lot of the current literature that seems to present the world as though it is understood. And I'm hoping to disrupt that, both in terms of how, how storytellers plan their games and the way that players play in those games. I think that a big issue with the old literature is that the people that wrote it were very limited in their access to accurate information, both in terms of cultural presentation as well as geography and history of a given region. And we can't entirely blame them for that either. You know, this was during a time in which, um, like when we're talking about the older editions especially, um, they were putting out new books almost every month. And the writing team had little to no time to actually conduct research on the subject matter that they were writing. And so many of them were limited to what kind of information was available to them in films um, and books they read growing up and what they could source at their local library, as well as what they knew to look up at their local libraries. This was all written before Wikipedia was really a thing. And what wound up happening was we wound up getting served a world that was very kind of middle ground, where not a lot of cultural risks were taken and those that were taken were generally showcasing the general movie and TV show stereotypes that were emblematic of the time in which they were written. Yeah, uh, one of the first GM talks I had, I had uh, someone from Brazil on, uh, and he talked about how Rage Across the Amazon brought up this very specific spot in Rio, and he's like, that's a historic site. There's absolutely nothing there. And so, in fact, <laughs> yes. So funny thing. <laughs> Guess who's also from Brazil? Oh, fantastic. <laughs> uh, no, but yeah, it's the way the books have depicted, particularly the Amazon and everything. It's 
it's tough and even like uh not to veer too much into the topic but even like uh fifth edition both for vampire and werewolf the things that have been brought up about brazil it never quite hits it as a brazilian reading it it's like okay maybe you needed someone from there to talk about it if you really wanted to talk about it in previous editions of course it's more understandable as manda said lack of information all of that but as we move forward it's it's one of those uh, one of those things are trying to make the game more localized to be able to write on what we all know but also really inspire gms to do proper research to portray other places and expand our world of darkness and to make their own local werewolf uh, or not even local in any place in the world so long as you're taking that careful approach to actually understand what you're writing about and i think that that is one of the really important things that i'm wanting to present here is that i want the world of darkness to truly be dark i like the idea of of the concept abstractly of being in a large black room with a candle when you're walking around in the dark with a candle you can only really see what's in front of you and while you may move to different parts of the room and see what's in front of you you'll never entirely know exactly what's happening everywhere and that's kind of how i'm wanting to present this world as being something that's far too large and moving and complicated for any one individual in their particular locale to fully understand what's going on um and at the same time i'm wanting to showcase just how large a small region can be in a story like there is a uh, there's a central theme that we're kind of presenting here in which while we are not saying that werewolf the apocalypse is solely in the pacific northwest united states we are writing it centered around that location and we are expanding and putting as much information and love and detail into this that even this little slice of the world is something that is gonna have so much going on within it that a person can literally play for years within the setting without having to leave and discover new things every session and rather than try to present a showcase of every location like with a series of rage across the world books i would be seeking to serve as an example for other storytellers to look at their own locales and their own backyards where they are and to write about the things that they know best and what they grew up around because i think that that is where much more genuine and human connecting stories can be found you know when a person is writing about the things that scared them when they were growing up when a person can represent the cultures that they come from and are a part of i think that that what comes across is a lot more genuine and a lot more heartfelt yeah and also i would say there is this uh that topic of timelessness that we were mentioning i think this also adds up to it's a very interesting experience to not only keep exploring the same location every session there's more to discover but if you also span the same setting over the course of years you can play with the timeline here you can have a game set say in the 70s and then take a peek on how that same location how that same setting looks like a few decades later how things change and all of those things you spent so long figuring out and finding out and building are now different and now there's even more things to discover and just goes on for as long as you want you can just really have this infinitude to this reserve small location that you can do everything with in many ways it's akin to building one's own mythology in their locales pretty much uh, things that evolve because there could be some grand event that happens in a particular location and then maybe a 10 years later in that same location um, that thing that happened in the past comes up again, and the new people that are here have to figure out what happened back then and resolve that event that took place. That makes sense. I was uh, going to say that I used that kind of mysterious thing to kind of explain like my OSR games, because uh, as I point out, here in Colorado, uh, the number of suspected abandoned mining sites, or what you could make as dungeons, is over 23,000 
in just this state. So when people wow. talk about needing huge maps to explore to find interesting locations, that turns out to not really be the case. You can it's pretty densely packed, right, with uh, quote unquote adventure sites. Something I'd like to add. And I think that this is part of what will be a refreshing look upon the content with an already pre-written material for Werewolf because there's years of publications. But this will provide a certain, how would I put it, a window, a context for both players and storytellers to perhaps even revisit their own personal canon by using this as an example to really fill out what, as a whole, Werewolf really has kind of skimped on. And this is where a lot of inspiration was taken from the, the BNS material. And of course, I'm referring to the governance, as opposed to merely, you know, Jonas Albrecht, long may he reign, sitting on his throne with the silver crown over in La La Land, which is wonderful, love the guy. But we've taken a step to make a little bit more, dare I say the word, political intrigue or possibility is probably the more appropriate word to bring things more home uh and what a a gaian which is the term we're using a gaian because we are all of gaia whether you're a kinfolk or you are a full uh shifted uh, guru or another pharaoh um these are things that will be apparent to you as opposed to perhaps something that leans too far into the human local governance because you're a part of a spiritual governance you're a part of a whole different group of people so this material will really bring that into your play which should create a lot more interactability on a social level i think you said something very very interesting there i said something similar a few days back i don't know if mondas will remember we're having a session zero thing and i said something similar with how i want to manage my own games progressing and will absolutely be running the hell out of my own project when, uh, once it releases of course but uh, until we get there until our book is uh, released uh i was saying something like and i think this is what we are all trying to do with this project this is what our book is about it's an invitation for even the veteran but especially the veteran players to take a step back and reintroduce themselves to guru try and approach this as if it's your first time even if it isn't for a second just try and let go of those biases try and let go of how you've been running things uh how your perspective on certain elements of the lore and the meta plot and all of that and try to reapproach it with that truly the cleaf wonder the cub wonder a freshly changed guru stepping into this massive world they cannot comprehend and relearning bit by bit try different things challenge yourself to reinvent how you approach this game and of course make something a lot more welcoming to new players to inexperienced players in general but i think it's a great opportunity for people who've already had their share of werewolf to really rethink the whole thing for the better hopefully yeah speaking of factions i noticed uh two things in in this one that I kind of wanted to dig in because I'm curious about the thought processes behind it. Uh, one, I noticed that the uh, the stargazers were absorbed by the children of Gaia, so I'm curious as the thought process behind that. And then I noticed a new a new tribe had come about recently, uh, and I was wondering if you could get into that tribe as well. Absolutely. Um, so. Speaking of the stargazers, um, something that um, seems to have kind of been forgotten by many um, old and new players alike is that um, before 20th Anniversary Edition came out, the stargazers weren't in very good shape as a tribe. Um, there weren't a whole heck of a lot of them left, um, enough so that they had already left the Garu Nation and joined the the Eastern Beast Courts. Um, and it was simply because um, the, the number of their tribe members had been uh, decimated both through war as well as their, their more inward focus on who they were and where they stood as a tribe. Um, 
Now, when one looks at both the game from the perspective of Wild West and from Mind's Eye Theater, um, it starts to paint a relatively dire picture of the shape that the tribe is in. Um, back during the Wild West, which in this game we're calling it the Age of Storms, um, you had the Storm Eater that was ravaging the Umbra and was eroding the, uh, the uh, gauntlet. Um, and to get rid of it, to basically, um, to, to get the situation under control, um, the Stargazers had to enact a special rite called the Rite of the Open Skies. This was a gargantuan effort, um, that required the cooperation of all the tribes, and it resulted in the deaths of many, many Guru. Um, in Mind's Eye Theater, Werewolf, um, the Storm Eater wound up coming back um, during the Age of Apocalypse. The events that had transpired following Rage Across the Heavens created, um, as well as um, a lot of covert actions being taken by the Black Spiral Dancers and the Worm on the Hole uh, to poison the Cairns across the world, um, created the perfect conditions for the Storm Eater to reemerge, and reemerge it did as the only known means to eliminate the Storm Eater was this Rite of the Open Skies, it once again fell to the Stargazers to bring this about. And so the Stargazers again wound up working to create a cooperation between tribes to enact this massive rite. Um, but this time, um, Cairns across the world were falling. Um, the Storm Eater had been, the Storm Eater as well as Banes and the Black Spiral Dancers had been poisoning the hearts of Cairns and sapping their energy um, right under the Garu's no noses for years. Um, and by the time Garu started fighting back, many of the Cairns had begun to fall. And the eventual passing and enactment of this rite decimated. Uh, many of the remaining numbers of the Stargazers. And once the dust had settled, there were really not very many of them left. Like, even going into it, there was maybe... I could be wrong about this, but, like, even, even back in Revised, there was about a hundred or so Stargazers left in the world. And after this right, dozens had perished in this effort, both in helping to defend Cairns, as well as to uh, bring about this right and have it, and have it come to pass. They're being absorbed into the Children of Gaia um, happened for two reasons. One is that uh, they were at great risk of the lessons that they had learned over the millennia becoming lost with the deaths of the Stargazers and wish to preserve that knowledge for future generations. And the other reason was that people hadn't been listening to the Children of Gaia for a very long time. They had often written them off as pacifists, and they had written them off as people that presented a more lukewarm, liberal presentation of symbolic peace but nothing tangible and readily apparent. And in absorbing them, it gave the children of Gaia a strong backbone, both for centering themselves and giving them a vision to pursue, which was that they use this connection through the stargazers to bridge communication gaps with uh, the changing breeds, in particular the Garal, um, as well as the uh, Mokole, to bring back the hearts of Gaia from extinction and begin the slow and laborious process of renewing the world's cairns, which is kind of where the roles of children of Gaia have changed. Rather than driving and forging peace between septs, they are now nurturers and teachers, in which they both teach people how to nourish the land and care for it, as well as how to heal wounds, both in terms of uh, literal wounds with each other, as well as wounds of the heart and wounds in society. So I'd say that that's kind of the things that drove the stargazers towards being absorbed by the children of Gaia, as well as um, 
how that changed the tribe on the whole. All right, cool. And then uh, this new tribe from the Dawn tribes, I believe. Yes, the. Uh... Um. Well, there's a few major things that happened with the Dawn tribes, and for those that are um, that are kind of uh, old comers to the game, you would have known these as the Pure tribes, being, of course, older brother and younger brother. In this case, I've expanded them to encompass all indigenous American tribes, which which includes Bastet, it includes Garal, um, it includes the uh, the uh, Nuisha and Korax um, and Mokole, and more recently, it includes um, the Hearthbound, whom they saw a kinship with. Because in the same way that many of their own numbers had been decimated in the Age of Storms, they saw many of the same tactics that the Garu Nation had been using to control them were now being used to attempt to eliminate this this uh, potentially new tribe that was rising. And so the Hapil, which is the word that we've adopted for older brother, they adopted the Hearthbound as their little cousins in spirit. They taught them to adopt their ways of teaching and mentorship, as well as stewarding the land and their relationship with the spirits, and offered them the protection that other tribes did not. And this allowed the Hearthbound to flourish. And, um, you, oh, I was in, sorry to interrupt. And the Hearthbound, they, you said they're a new tribe. Are they based off of the, um, I'm trying to remember the older version, the Sibirak, like mini tribe, or... How did they start to form, I guess, is what I'm asking. So um, they started to form with, I think that I want to say it started at Sept of the Tri Spirals with the Fianna, um, which in this game we're calling them the Sky Singers. I think it might be worth uh, just to quickly interject with the yeah, names we've changed. And like in general, not me particularly, but like in general, might be good to clarify the names we changed and why we chose the new name specifically, just to avoid confusion and make things a bit smoother to explain from here on out. That's a good idea. As you said, we've changed the name of the Fianna to Sky Singers. We have older brother now as Hapil and younger brother as Kalaril. You definitely could explain those two a lot better than me. Absolutely, yeah. So there are a few terms that we've changed and others that we've adopted. One of them is um, starting with the Fianna, change them to Sky Singers. One is that the Fianna as a name is a very Irish name. And the Fianna have kind of always encompassed all Celts. And that includes a very large chunk of Europe. And the Sky Singers is a name that comes from the revised tribe book for the Fianna. Um, they have many names listed in the first chapter. And... Um, this is something that's meant to be more emblematic of their representation as a global tribe. And that's kind of one of the things that we're hoping with that tribe is to move away from some of their more unhealthy stereotypes of how they're depicted, in short, as magical drunks. When it comes to the Hapil and Kalaril, Older Brother is a tribe that their name itself isn't necessarily bad or taboo. However, it does represent spirits that are represented and venerated in real life tribes. And the name for Younger Brother, um, of course, is emblematic of a monster, in short. Um, one whose name, even mention, is considered forbidden by members of, of uh, Native American tribes. And in short, Maintaining and adopting that name and continuing its use is immensely disrespectful, not just to the tribe, but in a way that is that precludes actual indigenous players from being able to play them or represent them, even if it's meant to represent them. And so those are the main driving forces behind those names. Now, what was, again, the meaning behind Hapu and Kalaril? I think that would be very interesting to explain a little bit. When it comes to making names for tribes and picking names for tribes as well as certain game terms i had to consider the notion of the guru as being a society that predates humanity and the rise of humanity and the existence of humanity 
and it's one that started with wolves rather than humans. And so it made sense to me, at least, that they should have their own words. So in short, I created a language for the Garu, um, a conlang, if you will. I call it first tongue, and it has its own dictionary and grammatical rules and, uh, and uh, word genderings. And that is where those names came from. Um, Hapil means the river people. Uh, Kalaril means the ocean people. And it's a language that I took many of the words from the original Garu lexicon, and I broke them into their guttural terms, and I combined that with phonetic sounds of wolf howls and calls. I created associations with them, and joined them up with the common suffixes and entitles that come with the game, you know, like the term Rhea, Youth, and such. And I use that to build a language that incorporates what I call triadic gendering, in which um, a person not only speaks a language, but they, but they uh, use expressions of the triad in order to add emphasis, emotional weight, and possessiveness to the thing that they're speaking of. So, in other words, there is a wild language of first tongue, there is a weaver language of first tongue, and there is a worm language associated with first tongue. And uh, using this conlang is where I'm creating a lot of my new words and languages being used in the game. That is really interesting, actually. I'm curious, because I didn't get this in the, the preview you sent me, obviously, is in terms of system, is it going to be very close to the original? Or are you making any kind of major changes or just a couple tweaks here and there? Is it frameworked off of uh, 20th or is it closer to maybe revised or an earlier edition? I think that experienced players that look into Werewolf the Essentials are going to find things simultaneously extremely familiar and also very different. And I can talk a little bit by like walking through the process of making a character. So at the st- at the top of it all, like when you're first assigning your points, we're no longer dealing with primary, secondary, and tertiary assignments of points for points buying. Um, when it comes to purchasing attributes, uh, you have 15 points that you can spend across all of them. When it comes to your, to your abilities, you have 27 points you can spend across all of them. A big reason for this is mostly to give a bit of a break to the lupus and other characters that tend to have much more strengths and emphasis in other aspects of their sheet um, than they would. So we're no longer having to having to force the lupus to you know take several points in academics or research or or investigation or things that they're like likely never going to use over the course of game. Um, and we found that just letting people allocate those points themselves, um, while keeping the same rules of, you know, you can't spend more than three points before freebies on your abilities, doesn't lend itself to much abuse going that way and making that approach. It, it also worth to clarify that those, uh, specific numbers, those amounts were already the amount that you would spread. You were just locked into specific spendings in each category, which really also got in the way of making the character you want. Because sometimes uh, the things you wanted the most were in different categories, like between abilities and attributes, and you had to assign the big number to one and the small number to one, and it could lack in some areas while exceeding in others you weren't particularly interested in. This all around just, uh, as Manda said, does not result in abuse of points, but also really gives more freedom and, as we've seen so far, much more well-rounded characters, really. Players just focus those points on what really matters for their character, for their concept. It's just really tearing down that arbitrary barrier of, oh, you have to put 13 here and 5 in this other one, and even though that will just make your life worse. We just took that out, mostly. That makes sense. No, I... I think I saw that posted in one of the discords and it sounds like a couple of people house ruled that as well. So I think that's a definitely an excellent I change. 
I think it's one of the most common house rules. I think I have a friend that GMs even uh, Chronicles of Darkness, and even for Chronicles, he uh, uh, house rules that same thing for the the spread of points. I think it's the more common one. Yeah, especially since so just I think, incorporate. Yeah, because I think Chronicles as well. They they prevent the abuse by the last dot costs two instead of uh, one. Another feature that's coming to change is appearance and perception have been replaced by composure and resolve, respectively. Uh, people may recognize that um, in the latest edition of Werewolf. It's something that I think that was actually a very smart move in terms of uh, creating characters, in that you now have each of the aspects of one's attributes are now equally weighted under under physical, social, and mental um, attributes. You have a feature that represents the raw ability. You have something that represents the deftness or the ability for one to respond quickly and on the fly to something, as well as something that represents one's resilience in that particular thing. In which case, in social, you have, you have your composure, which is kind of like the stamina of social interactions. And you have your resolve under your mental, which represents your ability to stay focused on something and to stick with it. Um, in terms of the respective roles that they would be replacing, it's a 1-1. One, one, where you would normally be rolling appearance, you're now rolling your composure, where you would normally roll your perception, you're now rolling resolve. So very little should be changing at the tabletop in those main things. A positive consequence of this is that willpower is no longer tied to tribe. You simply get your willpower by adding your composure and resolve together. Another major change that's coming is one that I'm particularly happy about and excited for is spirit affinities um, in place of gifts. Well, that's not entirely true. It's spirit affinities are now what gives a person access to gifts. For those that have been playing this game for a while, particularly since first edition, you'll find many, many copies of the same gift across the board. And so I think that we wound up tallying it and there's like nine different variations of, of Hare's Leap that's out there like scattered across different books and it's the exact same gift with the exact same mechanics and it tells you to go to the same page in the core book in order to find while giving it, you know, the same arbitrary name. And in many ways it just wastes page space while accomplishing very little in terms of, of bringing something new to it. And something that is fairly consistent behind many of these gifts is that they're all taught by spirits. Like, you know, if you have a certain gift that's taught by a water spirit, they will just say that expressly in the gift's description. This gift is taught by a water spirit. This, this gift is taught by a rabbit spirit. This gift is taught by a fire spirit, etc., etc. And the way that spirit affinities works is it really capitalizes on the spirits and what they teach. So rather than giving a fixed list of gifts, when somebody picks a tribe or an auspice or a breed, there will come with them a list of spirit affinities. And a person will instead pick their spirit that is particularly dedicated to that guru to teaching them. Like, let's say somebody's playing a hapil, and they decide that um, a water spirit is one of their main affinities. Out of the gates at rank one, they're not going to have three gifts or one gift. They're going to have an entire pool of gifts that they can use that are associated with that particular spirit delineated by rank still. So if you have a list of gifts that a water spirit teaches, that spirit is going to give you access to all the gifts that they have to teach, um, as long as you're in the respective rank that allows you to use them. It's a little bit like a spell list or, uh, or schools of magic, if we're looking at this from a fifth edition or d and in general approach. One of the ways I would use to criticize how prior editions handled gifts over the periods of time that they just sort of exist in companion official publications, players would typically treat it like a buffet table of powers. And like, I mean, that's cool if you know how to min-max and all that. That's great. But now we're moving from a theme to 
well, the buffet table of what's the best thing on the table. So this gives a little bit more um, flavor. I, I realize I'm doing a lot of food references. I guess I'm kind of hungry. Um, this gives <laughs> a lot more fair. flavor for what you're playing, who they are, where they come from, and what they would have learned. And I also think, even though like spirits are at the forefront anyways, because yeah, you would have to seek them out and seek their chimney to learn the new gift. It It's not something that was always in depth. Sometimes if there wasn't enough time, like, oh, okay, you go into the woods, you find the spirit. Okay, you learn the gift, you spend your XP. And this really puts the spiritual type and the relation of the guru with spirits to a lot more prominence. And also, let's be real. Uh, the starting list for Hamid Gifts is terrible. Everyone picks Master of Fire if they get the choice. Everybody. Or Ape's Craft Blessing if you happen to shoot guns. That's very useful. No, that, that makes sense. Uh, how I got around that was if I didn't have time in the session to do a spirit journey, I, what I do is I do a downtime thing, and then we just decide what the downtime activity is without any rolls. Except maybe like a random... Did it go bad? Uh, That's I... another important thing you mentioned there. Uh, downtime activities are now a mechanic in the game. Oh, really? Um, as are quests. Yeah. The game continues happening. The world turns and days and nights pass in between sessions. Effectively, one week represents one downtime action. And the things that a person can do with a downtime action are tied to what are called quests. A quest is something that a character wishes to accomplish with varying degrees of difficulty and complexity. And there are various complications that are associated with wishing to accomplish a quest. An example of a quest could be learning a rite, it could be um, following up on a lead and investigating it to try to find the root cause of some kind of event that took place. It could be uh, something as complex as trying to buy off a flaw and having to go through all of the lengths that are required to confront the elements of this flaw. It could be learning something from another NPC or perhaps gaining their alliance. And it could be as grand as, um, say, trying to recover a lost artifact or creating a new right or a gift or something like that. Okay. And people can pool downtime actions together to accomplish them. And each of the complications that can come up basically need to be fulfilled in order for a quest to be feasible. Something that, that, they, that they are in fact capable of accomplishing. Like for example, let's say somebody wanted to learn the right of still waters. Okay, um, They need time to learn this thing. So that would be their downtime action spent doing this. They would need somebody to teach it to them. That would be another complication that they need to fulfill. So they would need to know somebody within their sept that knows this right. They would need they would need access to the components in order to perform this right. In which case, you know, it would be something as simple as a glass of water, but that would be something that they would have to fulfill. Um, and they would also... Another complication to this would be another um, aspect of complication to this would be it would need to be local enough to them. Um, accessing this person to teach them and getting back to their to their to their pack in time for the next game session, so they wouldn't be able to travel too far in order to uh, make this happen. And if the player is able to basically answer and fulfill all of these complications, the storyteller can then be like, okay, well, it looks like you can accomplish this. So go ahead and give me some roles, and we'll see how these interactions go. And once they give their roles, the storyteller can, can provide them that feedback. And this is something that can happen away from the table, like in messages, or it can happen over emails. And if it, if it um, unveils some kind of greater complication then that can become the topic of the next session that's coming up. Like, you know, if somebody discovers that, that, you know, the local fast food place is turning people into zombies, they come back, they tell their pack about it. Next thing you know, the next game session when everybody convenes is them confronting this fast food restaurant. One thing I think it's really great about this mechanic, something that really changes a bit the dynamics of games, again, reapproaching how we tell stories, 
I get this feeling, especially from all the actual plays I uh, watch, my own games, friends' games, World of Darkness, Werewolf, like, most games really have this sort of... Most games are a straight line, not in the sense that they're linear, because, you know, you can do anything, but really, like, you're just following from where you stop, and sometimes even a grand story really resolves itself in the span of a few days, unless you do time skips. But even then, it's like within the session, okay, we did a time skip or in between sessions. We did a time skip, we're here now, heal up, let's continue from where we left off. And I think this kind of encourages a more episodic approach for those interested in it that can, again, shift dynamics and really expand the story in many directions, give a more like organic progression to things, that time for things to really breathe and develop. Instead of everything, such great changes happening from one night to the next, uh, it really has that time to develop the world and become part of it, which I think it's kind of a breath of fresh air. Yeah, I, I've run into those issues in my own actual play, though certain things, they built up over years, and my players found out years later. Which yeah, is like and it's to... something like, Werewolf has this thing where like a lot of times the players are meant to belong to the Sept, but like, if you're going from one plot point to another in a straight line from one side to the other, if there's few downtime, you're not really living in the Sept. Why would you like build a cabin in the Sept and live off the Sept and help the Sept hunt for food and all of those things? Like You're not at your house. Your character is out in the streets doing things all the time. You don't really have that moment to really belong and just sit down and, oh, this is my place in the world. This is where I am. This is where I belong. This is the things I do in my daily life. The plot is not my daily life. This is my daily life. And the plot is, you know, the call to action that's pulling me away from it. Yeah, no, that that does make that makes perfect sense to me. Uh, I noticed the addition of the unborn and uh, mm-hmm. that's another by night uh, mind's eye theater edition, correct? They are. Yeah. Uh, what? Um, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, what uh, what was the inspiration to pull those in? Because I know. I've heard mixed things. I, d- I've, I don't LARP, right? Uh, so I've heard mixed things about the Mind's Eye Theater guru from forums, which I know isn't exactly the pinnacle of getting the pulse for anything. So I was just curious as to what drew you to, to them to bring them into this edition and uh, just uh, your overall feelings of the Mind's Eye Theater werewolf uh lark book that inspires I just make stuff. A very quick comment on that because i think a lot of people approaching this pro- project and even listening to this gm talks are gonna feel this uh it's so interesting that there's so much on the lark book and up until this project i never even heard about it so it, it's and i've been playing this game for a few years now like i consider myself a, a lore junkie i read lore for fun and i just never heard about it and when the project was for when i first saw about the project and saw the unborn i was like oh they're making a homebrew and it was like no there's this actual entire book that introduces them i was like holy shit how did i not know about that and even for people that don't larp i would recommend looking at that book because there's a lot of things you can pull from that uh but the player project it's we're already doing that for you but now please do Tell about the Unborn. So, um, what drew me to the Unborn and Bitten to bring them in is... I have a couple of reasons for this. One is that not everybody wants to play a teenager. Your typical Garu that goes through their typical first change, they experience this when they're a teen and they're first learning to assert boundaries around themselves. And when they start realize that there are boundaries that need to be set and boundaries that are being crossed, this is when the rage is typically evoked. Um, and simply put, not a lot of people want to play a teenager. Another aspect is that I see the unborn and particularly the bitten as being extraordinarily queer coded as a playable breed. One is that they are out of the running gates considered to be others within the Garu society. They are, in becoming Garu, they were deeply affected by their first changes. Many of them had a life of their own. 
before they received the bite. And going through the bite, where your typical guru experienced the first change and everything that they saw is something that they just blanked out, blacked out, saw red, and then they come to after, after everybody's dead. The unborn, they remember every second of that event. And even the lead up to that event is an entire month of torment and asking questions and seeing things constantly harming them uh, from both them being sick and from them experiencing increased tension and anxiety. And I love the way that the unborn and bitten use trauma as a vehicle for change and transformation. And when, even when they become guru, many guru will accept them into their own, but not in the same way that they would accept your traditionally formed guru that goes through their first change of their own accord. In that, like the Krinos born, the bitten cannot reproduce anymore. Uh, when somebody experiences a fever as long as they do, it renders them sterile. They are forever marked and harmed by their first change, giving them effectively mark of the predator. So animals shy away from them. Uh, human beings pick up their inherently threatening nature. And this person is forever touched in some way that literally everybody that they interact from that point forward is going to treat them as an other. Uh, somebody that is inherently an outsider, different from them, doesn't have their same, same shared experiences, and leads to, to exclusion. This is something that allows those who wish to explore them the potential to use queer-themed stories without having to touch directly on the experiences that they live through every day that are themselves traumatizing. It gives them an auspice of being able to safely approach them in a narratively compelling way. Very quick comment. Uh, one word we've been using a lot internally, or I have at least, is catharsis, really. Uh, this is a discussion we had recently, actually. Uh, we were just talking about it, how we are doing that work to really uh, work upon those problems. Werewolf has its a product of its time, as we've already said many times. And there's a lot of things to fix and improve, but not every problem. The way to solve pro ev problems is you don't need to remove them entirely, every single one. Some aspects remain so that they become a tool for players to confront those problems and through catharsis really find that place of solace and closure and really feel like they're confronting a wrong. You can have that as a narrative tool to be like, this is an ideal, this isn't right, and we can actually fight about it in the confines of this fictional reality. And for a lot of people, it's why we play characters that speak so closely to us, to our trauma, like the like the unborn and the crying was born, uh, and also how some tribes may hold outdated views and that sort of thing, because it's meant to be, that generational conflict is also another tool to be like, we can change for the better. If the book entirely removes all those problems and it's a perfect utopic world with no conflict and no problems to discuss, then really where's the change? Where's the progress? You're not really fighting for anything, it's just slashing things with no sense of purpose. And I think it's important to distinguish that because there is a lot of discussion about Werewolf being a problematic game and some people not wanting to give it a try because of those problems. And we live in a moment that's very delicate to deal with certain topics. And what I hope people to understand is we are very sensible about everything we write. And if certain things certain heavy themes and topics are still in the game. It's not an endorsement. It's not really using it in an edgelord way as a power fantasy. It's really as a narrative tool of confrontation and to really face those things that we often can't as we would like to in the real world, to tell that story about positive change within the game. I agree. Something, something I'd like to piggyback on as well with that, and this is perhaps the perspective of, let's say you do have a player who doesn't quite know where to start. 
when it comes to werewolf. And a common thing I tend to find is either you have new players who come into play and they jump far. They jump into the deep ends without really taking a chance to absorb everything that that the culture, and I'm not necessarily speaking about the human culture, but the guru culture, including lore and history and certain expectations that the character would have experienced to get to where they are. Something that the bitten really provides for in this case is an opportunity to still have, as said before by Mundus, an older character who may not be, um, the term that is used internally is kenning, um, meaning aware of the uh, the internal dynamics, perhaps some of the history, some of the religiosity versus callow. You can be callow, unaware of all those intricacies, but the relationship that a storyteller can provide is one where there's a lot more soft behavioral control. And I'll, of course, bring up the horror story of the lost cub syndrome, where I'm sure there are plenty of STs and players out there who have seen that there are cases where people they dive in really without an awareness of the material and they go with a lost cub and nine times out of 10, it's really bad. It isn't very productive unless you have a very cha uh, uh, challenging and powerful player who can use that and channel that capability to create something and genuinely learn. Sometimes there's a lot of friction. This is a way to kind of approach that, but it still has a security net to, to reel them in to the fold, so to speak. And another reason I bring this as well uh, is to tie back to another topic, to call back to another topic, that uh, uh, what are we saying with the, the unborn and the certain things remain because there is a narrative reason for it. It's not gratuitous, is the word I was not being able to remember. That, that goes for both Krynos born and the unborn in this situation where they're outsiders and mind you crinos born we're really uh amping them up in this we're giving them the, their deserved love it doesn't mean that they're suddenly well accepted and they have no problems and the sky singers is one of those examples of all we're talking about they still have that very poor relation with crinos born they are still one of the worst examples of how crinos born are treated and they're Again, narrative reason to have tribes that treat them well and tribes that uh, treat them poorly to really create this scenario like where they stand and where can they go from here and the changes that arise from those problems. And uh, at, it's a callback to the half valve, which we started talking about, and we kind of uh, went on to talk about the, the name <laughs> changes and lost that topic a little bit. Yeah. So I'm calling that back. Uh, and of course, Mundus, as the author of the the Hearthbound, would explain this a little better. But they were born because of those problems with the. It started there as one of the the things, but stages you're to talk more in depth about that. But it's a, an example of like conflict and problems and outdated views can generate better change, and we have that example in the game with those tribes. Yeah, I guess following it back a little bit on Hearthbound to explain them. Um, the problems that existed within Werewolf the Apocalypse are something that was never really meant to be romanticized at the tabletop. The writers kind of assumed that storytellers and players could read between the lines and recognize the problematic aspects of these cultures and be willing to confront them at the tabletop and more or less have their characters decide where they stand on these things. Um, where, you know, a lot of the reason why the Garu Nation was failing in the war against the Worm was inherently tied to their inability to cooperate and reconcile their differences with one another. Um, and the Hearthbound were created to represent the consequences of the Nation's failures to address their own shortcomings. Um, and to explain to those that are relatively new to the concept of Hearthbound, um, they are a tribe that consists almost, but not entirely, of Krenos-born Guru that were aided in fleeing the septs that raised them to be raised in loving kinfolk homes. 
um, more or less treated like people. And the result of that is a tribe that doesn't hold themselves to the same stereotypes that your typical guru does. Their war is less directly against the worm and more about holding other guru to task. For those that were too inwardly focused on attacking their own kind, be it, you know, the objectification of kinfolk or the wanton, codified, ableist abuse of other Kranosborn, the Hearthbound represent the consequence of that as being the judges of those guru that have long abused the litany as a reason to harm others. Many of their abilities, many of their strengths and leanings are uh, both from a combination of needing to blend in among other guru, as well as being able to discern the truth. And like many of the other new aspects that I've written for the, the game, they are, again, very queer-coded in terms of they grew up being very different from everybody else around them and being punished for those differences. And it's only natural that people that are targeted and punished for simply existing are going to seek each other out for support. That's how subcultures form. Something I would also add to that, there's an element to the Hearthborn that, especially for those advanced storytellers and players who have read quite a bit of the books and are familiar with a lot of the mythology within Werewolf, they are very close to the Celestine Shantar. And if you're familiar with Rage Across the Heavens, and if you are familiar with Shantar, even if you are a mage and you're familiar with Neptune, you will start to see that there are implications that are very good for storycraft in there, along with all of the representation and all of the creativity that they as a, shall we call it perhaps a manufactured tribe, but what that provides for. It's fundamental for creating something new in this material that really has not been, as far as I'm aware, done before. I think it's a good step in the right direction. It makes this, it, it brings the game forward. Even though we're taking certain timelines and moving them a few steps back, it brings things forward so you don't have this, dare I say, like a, well, this is how the tribes are. They never, ever change. They've been that way forever. You know, now we actually have something new to touch. Yeah, I think there's a lot of that, really, uh, both with uh, the Hearthbound. I like the term of a, a crafted tribe, but also like I would like to say a tribe of consequence, really. And also like with the Stargazers melding into the Children of Gaia and really shifting the dynamic of the Children of Gaia. Finally, some yeah, justice. The Children of Gaia are not people. pushovers anymore. I'm so glad about that. As one of their two authors for this project, I am very glad to see my babies getting their accolades. Rightly deserve after 30 years of being well pushed around and bullied for no reason. Please Another do not listen. Not a... I was going to say, please don't listen to my actual play. I made them all like white liberal dicks. Uh... <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I can't entirely blame you for uh... that because that's how they're written. Like, um, but they're more politically I mean, savvy. It's true, though. It's I mean, it's like not, if you sadly, if yeah. you examine how they're written outside of the core books, it is like for anybody that actually enjoys the tribe, they're written by people that clearly hated them. Yeah, we yeah. say that a lot. They're like um, all the authors of Werewolf apparently hate them. Like in many ways, they were primarily made to be the tribe Samuel Hate comes from, and that they exist to create the consequences rather than be a truly functional tribe. I mean, they don't even have a cairn of their own. Like that's how that's how half baked they are as a tribe. Yeah. Not, I, not anymore. Yeah. I my one of my players, he he decided to read the first edition version of the Children of Gaia book because he knew that I don't or he's heard me straight up say that the revised one is not good. And he's just like Wow, no wonder everyone hates this tribe. They kind of fucking suck. Yeah. Yeah, for for someone to like the tri and they are my favorite tribe, I do intend on tattooing their glyph. So yeah, I do love this tribe, but it's uh, from the very beginning, I could see all those flaws, and I had to... When we were talking about read the subtext, 
you have to read the minimal text with them. <laughs> really, you have to go below sub to find the small nuggets of gold with this tribe because the writers were really not giving them a fighting chance. And in, in my own games, I always really put them as this political power of being mediators and really pushing things up. Uh, other tribes in the, a better direction and being like, please chill a little bit. Let's take a step back and re uh, rethink this. So it's great that we're giving them more. Well, we're doing this for all tribes. We're giving them all more nuance and reworking their cultural backgrounds instead of shying away from it. We're really trying to expand and go more in depth and bring that sensibility to it. And really, all tribes are getting that touch up. Of really just having more to them, more facets to them, more shades. Yeah. Really. Like, with my, I... the, uh, the big one was uh, their mentor figure who was like, a fa was like a father to them. Then they realized, oh, wow, you're actually kind of an asshole for a child of Guy. Because how I did it is, the children of Guy are absolutely typical Garu, my way or the highway. They're just more subtle about it. Where he's like, yeah, we're going to make this... Karen of Unity, kind of ignoring the fact that that Karen used to belong to older brother, and he only invited exactly. them back to their own Karen solely so that he had a leg to stand on politically to try and draw other Garu to that Karen. Pretty much. Pretty much, yeah. And in many ways, that was kind of the only way that, that the Children of Gaia could be represented. And something that uh, Lee Cat touches on is absolutely kind of an approach that I'm taking, is that every tribe kind of acts the way they do for a reason. The concept of, for example, the Geta Fenris, always seeking, seeking warfare and not looking for options that aren't about direct action and seeking a good death, in short, being one of their main concepts. It's something that isn't really entirely accurate when you actually look at the cultures where these tribes come from. And so we've kind of, like just using that tribe as an example, the Geta Fenris, we've kind of shifted them away for only look for a glorious death, and rather look for a cause worth dying for. Especially with the fallout of 5th edition, where a lot of fans of the Get are in utter dismay and depression, and my heart goes out for you. I think you're going to be very happy with how we're treating them. Oh, we're doing very good work. Yeah. Not to do my own harm, because uh, me and Mondas are writing them together, but like, we're doing good work. We're caring about it, and it's really... Uh, we're like, uh, like I said, we're expanding things. Uh, I guess to not give away too much for now, all I'll say is, really, they're not the Viking werewolf. It's, more, it's deeper than that, and also Viking is a job, not, a, not an entire culture of people. It's more complicated than that. So really, again, nuance, sensibility, shades of gray, instead of the really black and white writing. And there's more reason for certain traits to be present. I think my other last real big question is, and I'm just curious about it, is there are several other changes that we didn't really touch upon, but I did notice in terms of the tone, the tone is absolutely more hopeful than previous editions of Werewolf, and I was wondering if you wanted to speak to that and kind of talk about that. Yeah, so we are in what Dove has kind of recognized is a sort of uh, post-apocalypse scenario. <laughs> and when we say post-apocalypse, we're not saying the world has been destroyed. What we're saying is that the ways that once were are breaking, but that this isn't something that has given away to despair, but rather fundamental change. Like King Albrecht and his pack, with Mari and Evan Steele's The Past, they are gone, so to speak. They gave their lives in sealing away the Storm Eater once and for all, and with it the Silver Crown was lost. There is a council of tribes that democratically address issues that affect all Garu on the whole, but they're no longer a unified nation under a king. There are still, there is still a faction, the Western Concordat, that is seeking to bring back the ways that once were. Um, you know, they're very much so set 
in the um, in their old ways, and they more or less represent what remains of the Garu Nation, which would consist of um, Silver Fangs, Sky Singers, uh, Glass Walkers, and Get of Fenris. And, however, with that separation, it has allowed other tribes that have kind of suffered under this unified nation to be able to flourish on their own. Like, effectively, the Dawn tribes, which have been struggling ever since the Age of Storms, are seeing a sort of renaissance of rebuilding in the wake of this. Kalareel, a younger brother, their tribe patron, Old Windtooth, the cannibal spirit, um, is no longer their patron. In this history, he was their patron, but their, thought, their hearts have been thawed, and it was tragedy that paved the way for this to happen. Like, to be certain, it wasn't that Lord Albrecht and his pack perished, and then everything became greater for everybody. Uh, there was actually a lot of mourning that took place across the nation, across the world. And there were many repercussions of that. Many ways that once were, have broken. Some of the cairns in the world were saved, but almost all of them are gone. There's 13 cairns left in the world. 13 of the great cairns that were, that were created and built uh, using the old ways. And effectively, what one can best think of and approach this new era is that this is a post-war rebuild. You know, we're still picking through the wreckage of, of this very close call from which the Garu barely survived. But the consequences are very real. The Storm Eater and the Wyrm have worked very hard to deeply damage the Garu and their ability to function in the way that they once did. The most prominent of which is the fact that there's very little Garu that are actually experiencing their first change in the way that they used to. The Wyrm is actively working to suppress the wolf within people that would normally go through the first change onto their own accord. This is what created the conditions for the unborn to flourish. That actually reminded me of a Pentex uh, story seed where they were essentially flooding, I think it was antidepressants, into the water supply that was, uh, and because it delayed the first change, and if done long enough, the uh, the Garu could not go through their first change. That that is uh, that that's what tickled my mind when I read that section. Also, in the uh, first storyteller's handbook that came out, one of the example chronicles that they give you to give you kind of the tools to even start building stories was around the concept of there being no new guru being made and that the characters had to kind of figure out why that was happening in the first place. That would be uh, the Wastes of Thule, I believe they called it. Okay. I also um, think on the topic of it being more, like, hopeful, there's, uh, and particularly what said more hopeful than previous editions, and that's a curious thing to think about Werewolf, because uh, we were talking up until now about this whole thing, uh, of catharsis and using trauma as a narrative tool and all of those things. And especially uh, we have a very queer coded, I guess, approach to this whole project. But uh, all of us who come from marginalized groups, disenfranchised groups, minority groups, we understand that change through hardship and facing difficult times, facing injustice to reach better days and changing the playing field to give ourselves a better life and reach that better life. And in a sense, it's odd how Garu always had that, but at the same time don't play that because one of the selling points of Garu is you're this spiritual warrior fighting against those wrongs in the world, especially with how much monkey wrenching and fighting Pentax is a part of this game. You know, stopping those evil companies from doing all of those things, it should be about this catharsis of fighting those evils in the road, rooting them out, try and build a better future, even if there are losses and even if it's difficult. But a lot of times other editions would kind of give you that, but also pull the rug right up uh, right from beneath you and be like, oh, you're doing that, and you kind of won, but you know, you're going to die anyway. The worm's going to win, clearly. And it's kind of counterproductive to what the game is trying to reach, you know? It's meant to give that idea that it's possible to stand up and fight and i guess we're bringing a lot more of that of 
focus that it is possible to rebuild even if things are uh, dra dreary, really, because it should be about hope. Why would you be fighting if you don't have hope in the future? I think that's what really moves the, this game at its core, not just our project, but Werewolf as a whole. It's about fighting those wrongs and correcting them, or at least trying, or even if it means dying to ensure this for the next generation. Maybe you won't see the fruits of your labor, but those that are going to come next will, and it should be that hope for the next generation. And our game is entering the age of heroes, the age of apocalypse is over, so those are the seeds that are being planted for a better future. Um, this is also an exploration of themes of colonization. A lot of the core mechanisms of colonization and the damage that it causes is through the destruction of community. Where there are no elders and where there are no new guru, the ways that once were begin to break. This is how societies are broken down and integrated into others. And this is kind of... The Wyrm is kind of really capitalizing on the consequences of colonization as its strongest strength. Like this entire underhanded approach of destroying and attacking even the way that people become Guru has caused almost an entire generation of Guru that would have gone through their first change being eliminated. And the Black Spiral Dance is more or less intercepting them and transforming them into Guru has really forced the Garu Nation and friend groups that surround them to really have to change the way that they approach Guru and how they, they interact with them and treat them within their societies. Because if they don't, they're facing extinction. Okay. You know? Yeah. Um, no, if, there's, if there's no new stories being made, if there's no... If there's no youth, if there's no elders to teach them, you don't have a society anymore. Yeah, no, that makes uh, that makes perfect sense. Uh, so, I'm just curious, is the little round, little round robin? I was just curious of uh, closing thoughts or things that you really want to impress upon the listener about Werewolf: The Essentials and the experience you're trying to present. Uh, we'll just start with Dove. What I want to present upon players, both old and new is a way to invoke perhaps and i'm going to be probably a little closer to my heart a spiritual game and that should not be taken as prescribing necessarily a religion but there would probably be aspects of religiosity to it and to be able to invoke those sorts of themes you have a directive from a higher power and here you are chosen to do what is ultimately good that is not to say that you know you won't be in this world completely bloodless shall we put it but there is ritual to every aspect of your life there is value to family friends found family it's an opportunity to create something beautiful in the face of strife that strife can be something more personal or it could be something grander like, we need to stop the forces of darkness. It's, it's able to transcend both the close and the, the far. And I definitely encourage players, again, both old and new, to visit this and revisit their games. Because you can really build a lot of value in story and creativity when you look at the, this world through the lens that we're providing. Well, first of all, the all the words out of my mouth. I <laughs> second all of that because uh, spirituality is a big point from, to me. I am a, a neo-pagan myself. I am a chematic pagan. I'm not a religious person, but I am a spiritual person is what I always tell people. I don't follow a religion, but I do follow spirituality and those customs. And werewolf, from the very first moment I discovered about it, read it for the first time, the spiritual side of things always called to me this animistic world, and animism is so important in this game, and this tangible effect you have upon the world, and how everything is kind of interconnected, but fate is not entirely woven, it can still be changed and challenged, and it's really a game about not only finding your own place, carving your own place. I think people often mistake Werewolf to be a game about 
war in the sense of it being a game about combat, about slaying those monsters. Uh, I've had the misfortune of actually hearing someone say the uh, werewolf is the D&D of World of Darkness, which I wholly disagree with. Werewolf is about war, but it's not about just fighting. It's about the tragedy of war, how that affects a people, a community, a nation, really, how those cultures change through it, the hardships and the personal hardships of fighting this impossible war with a scale so much bigger than yourself and fighting that solace, that reason to fight. Why are you standing? For whom and what are you standing? And it's really about that. I think it's really easy to go epic scale with Garou, which is not a bad thing. We all enjoy an epic story from time to time, but I invite players and storytellers to take a more personal approach and really delve into those themes of belonging, of this is my home and I'll stand for it. This is, these are my people and I'll stand for them. Less about slaying the big bad monster. It's about I'm protecting the people that stand behind me. I'm strong because I have to fight for those who can't for a better world is what I hope people to get from this. The sense of finding yourself. So... I I think it was Dove that touched on this in the beginning, but I think it's very important to consider the perspective that you bring to this when you read it. And this is especially for older players, is think back to the first time you picked up Werewolf the Apocalypse and began to read it with a fresh set of eyes that had never seen this world before and seeing an entire culture unfold in front of you. I am trying to bottle that lightning. And that is what I am intending to present with Book One Cleath, which is, it is the narrative perspective, not of a objective showing of everything that Werewolf the Apocalypse has to offer, but rather an exploration of what an Adrin would be mentoring a Cleath, the things that motivate a Garu to action on an abstract level, the things that a Cleath would be excited to defend and protect, and the reasons that they would be tapping into their rage is what I'm hoping to capture and convey with this first book. I think that there's going to be a number of uncomfortable topics that are going to be touched on in this literature, and I think that if somebody brings it with the critical lens of being able to examine both the material as though it were being read with a fresh set of eyes and read in a linear format rather than seeking out the individual stats and the new stuff, that they can come to find the glory, honor, and wisdom that lie at the roots of our darkest fears. Thanks, everyone. So... Is uh, there any place any of you want to be found online if you want to be found? If you would like to read more about this game, feel free to head to deadmountain.gay or werewolf.1. I can also be found on Blue Sky and on Tumblr under the username Song of Trillium. That is T-R-I-L-L-U-M. Me personally, uh, you can find me in most places as Lee Cat Art. Uh, do be warned about the gunfin uh, troll and don't open that in public. But um, on most social media, I can be found um, currently really mainly active on Blue Sky. Uh, we're going to be having some actual plays coming soon on both Twitch and YouTube. Uh, starting with Werewolf the Apocalypse. Uh, more news on that soon. I'll be posting about that. And really, just an artist posting a bunch of doodles and uh, creative to the RPG projects for those interested in it. And for me, uh, you can find me uh, probably in a park tree. Um, sometimes I might be flying over your car. Just, you know, keep the windows closed. And if you ever need me, just squawk at the air, throw some bread around. I'll probably show up. I might not be as talkative as I am right now, but, you know, I'm always listening. Place a, a penny on the sun. It will reflect. It will summon. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, everyone. My name's Moon Keegan. This is a bunch of gamers. You can find us on Facebook, YouTube, 
Podbean, but you'll never find me on Twitter because it's a cesspool. Bye. <laughs> uh. <laughs>